Good morning, and I'm glad to share this stage this morning with three great experts. And let me welcome Andreas Kuntz, who is a co-founder and CEO of Connex. Welcome, Andreas. And please welcome Jeremy Arroche, who is founder and CEO of Quantmetry. And Sébastien Pialou, who is the Big Data Fab Director at SNCF Group. So we're going we're gonna to talk this morning about Internet of Things and how uh, it's going to meet AI. Guys, you're going to share your experience around that. Um, as you probably already all know, we'll have um, 50 billion devices that are forecasted in, two, in, um, in three years now. And so it's going to generate a huge amount of data. Question is, what are we going to do with that? And what can we and what should we expect with AI or from AI around that subject? Andreas, so you are the CEO and co-founder of a startup, uh, which is called Connex, and you are from Germany. I think the key, um, the key success factors for implementing AI-based IoT solutions are that you find the real use case where you have a clear ROI on that. For example, predictive maintenance is one of them, where you can easily calculate what you can save in long term. Because I think right now we're in a situation where a lot of pilots going on, and at a certain point when we implement them and also industrialize them, we we need to have the clear value proposition of, of those use cases. So that means if, if I can tell, or if you're going out today and measure manually track conditions, and I can, through, through smart IoT sensor systems and AI-based analytics, tell you in which period of time you should go out and maintain that, you, I mean, you have clear cost savings from the beginning. And I think this is key for large implementations, which are not out there yet, but yeah, hopefully will be in the future. And that's what you've been doing with uh, Deutsche Bahn in Germany, is it? Yeah, yes. so with Deutsche Bahn, we're in the process where we um, now currently industrializing it and rolling it out on the high-speed uh, high switch network, where, do, where we provide a sensor-based IoT predictive maintenance solution to tell them when they have to go out, with which tools to maintain their assets before they break down. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let's ask and share the experience of the SNCF. Uh, Sebastian, can you explain us what you've been doing and how do you use and what do you expect of AI uh, around your sensor that you have on the railway? So to, to understand your question, I think first we have to remind some basic figures about the SNCF and about, uh, about our activities. SNCF is carrying 2 million passengers per day in France uh, that are traveling from 3,000 stations uh, in 15,000 trains along 30,000 kilometers of tracks in France. So we have to do these activities to operate, to maintain, uh, uh, and to do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we have a huge, a huge stake here. Uh, we have an historic uh, about using data, but what IoT and big data and intellig artificial intelligence are bringing, it's a clear leverage to improve the quality of our production, as Jeremy said. And when you improve the quality of the production, then you improve the quality of service. I will say that when we talk about predictive maintenance, what it is? It is about detecting a potential failure on a train in real time, and then to repair it before the failure is occurring. So you avoid disruption, and when you avoid disruption, then you, um, you can uh, save time and you can avoid delays for your customers. And you, and you enhance the quality of the service that you deliver to your customers. Yes, definitely. So for new AI and IoT, it's a new territory. And uh, really, we have so many fields. We talk about predictive maintenance for train, but 
let's talk about also energy savings, about vegetation handling, about security, about uh, trucks maintenance, about and also about marketing, which is the base of uh, of the EI. Actually, it's in the historical past. So. Really, why it's uh, so wide? Because uh, with AI and IoT, you can take advantage of the four usage of the data. You know, data is used to know what has happened, to understand what has happened, to predict what will happen, and to uh, recommend what you might do. And the IoT part is very good on the first two ones, to know and to understand what has happened. Whereas the uh, AI will be used on the four items. Great, um, but I was wondering, is it, is it really that new? Because we're already doing like big data analytics. So what is really bringing AI on that? How do you feel about it? How do you, how do you experience that with your customers? You're totally right. Some things are, are new, but some things are quite older, not so, so, so old. Uh, we, we're talking about the way we behave with data for the past few years. We call it big data, we call it data science. I'm just taking a few seconds to say hi and to thank people from Talent who are leading company providing big data services. And Philip, who is here, has always been a, 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 an excellent mentor to make uh, Quantmetry get bigger. So thank you to Talent to organize this session. But you're right, some things are different, some things are new. So what is the same thing? The same thing is about the skills. People working on data and people working on artificial intelligence are the same type of people. They are engineers that can cope with data, they can do algorithm. So this is not really about new, but something is new. It's the mindset about how you provide value with artificial intelligence. Let's take two examples. The first one is about continuous integration. When you build an AI, you need to have a version. This version provides some quite of quality, but has some bugs. You need to change the version. You cannot cut the AI, say we're gonna stop for a while, and then we're gonna be have a better AI. No, you need to have a versioning and a change of version which is completely um, uh, transparent for the end user. So this is really different because then you have teams who works on ag agile methodology and that can provide uh, tools that can uh, report and pilot the continuous integration. Let's take a second uh, example. It's about the quality of the code. When you do something with artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence is wrong, and we have a lot of examples that AI was wrong in the, in the past, we have news about chatbots that get really racist because they are learning of bad words and stuff like that. What can you do when you need to change it? You need to have a structure of code and a quality of code which is so well documented that people can interact directly with the code and change it. That's a new way of working. It's not new skills, but it's new methodology to provide AI to large companies. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, before, I, I'd like to focus on your experience, Andreas. Um, what, what can you share with us? Like, what are their best things to do if you want to really have great results when you use AI? And maybe what are the issues or things you need to avoid? How do you, uh, how do you share that with your customers? And how can you share that with us today? So, <clears throat> I think one of the most important things in the beginning is to set the right expectations. So we, can, uh, we cannot expect everything from AI, but we can expect certain things. So I think um, everybody is talking now that we have all, we put all those data into the cloud, but if you, build a re if you start to build your model top down with machine learning um, or uh, AI methodologies, you really think about which data you need and which, it does, uh, which you don't need. And I think the most important thing is to keep the learning part, which is constantly happening um, on a cloud level or on a, uh, on a uh, away from the, uh, from the system, which always has to have to be secure. Just take an example with Tesla, where you have a car that has the intelligence on the, on the, uh, on the car itself but always has a connectivity that provides data to learn and but, but it gets updates just from time to time. So it's not dependent on the connectivity and on the cloud. It has its intelligence um, on the device itself. 
and it's the same with uh, with um, with complex sensor systems. So if you tr if you con if they are clo uh, closed systems and constantly working, you you gather out information, but they have to work on themselves, and you just learn and correlate information on a cloud level, and there is where I think AI has the biggest impact on learning new new use cases, improving the devices, which, but they have to have the intelligence uh, on site. Sebastian, yes, when we prepare this uh, panel, you shared a few uh, key success factors of what, w that you've been learning through your experience because you've done some POC and you are already um, in an industrialization phase for some of your projects. Can you share with our audience what are the, the key success factors you have identified and maybe what are the things to avoid if you really want to add value with AI on your uh, IoT and your, all the data that you get from IoTs? I think now we are at the beginning of history. So um, the good thing is that you have simple model that can create a lot of value. But a key success factor with IoT and AI will be to focus on the human factor. Uh, I could talk first about the 400 people currently in SNCF that are working specifically on IoT, but in fact, uh, in the whole the group, you have thousands of users. And the key point is to focus on the user and to embed the human factor. If, uh, if you allow me a little pun, um, Industrializing the intelligence of things, as you mentioned, it's moving from AI, artificial intelligence, to AI, artificial and human intelligence. So for that, you need two key principles, transversality and co-construction. Transversality because to, you, need, you, you will create a lot of value if you look uh, on a given pro uh, issue from a various angle. And I will take a concrete example. It's about a uh, use case that we have currently, uh, how we avoid that the wheel slip on the tracks. Because when it slips on the track, then the shape is changing. And so you have to uh, put the train uh, in maintenance. Uh, to understand uh, what has happened, we had to compute weather information, vegetation information, uh, information coming from connected train, uh, maintenance report, and so on and so on. And all those information were in different divisions. So transversality is a key success factor. The second one is co-construction. Co-construction because actually as the user is uh, at, uh, at, at the center of, of uh, our, um, our projects, then you have to sit at the table with them to understand what they really need. And we did that with uh, SNCF Réseau uh, in order to uh, save times with a help decision making tool. Uh, they were spending hours in calculation and uh, about uh, dry, drawing, uh, drawing analysis on what portion of uh, the uh, network should be uh, maintain or replace and now it only takes them two seconds and uh, this time that have been saved for those calculations they can really spend it on uh, something that matter for them which is uh, taking um, advantage of their expertise to really draft what will be their maintenance plan so the human uh, factor is a key for industrializing and for that you need transversality and co-construction Thank you very much. Um, Andreas, what are the fears that you may have or we may have around AI? Do you have like some issues? How do your customers and the, the, your, your B2B customer that you're helping around that kind of uh, subject, do they have any specific fears or do you, w would, we, would it be a, a total science fiction concept to, I don't know, like we were talking about movies and stuff like this. Is it, is it a total science fiction concept to think about AI wars around? Because we know that in IoT, security is very essential. How do you feel about that since you've been working already on all that? So, as I mentioned before, I think it's, it's, ex it's a lot of e explanation involved. I mean, what we and it always depends with which kind of data and how how you are in control 
of your own algorithm. If you look, um, if if you use learning methods that are uh, that you have in control or you don't have in control. In our case, we have them in control and we separate them on the cloud level, which is really the learning platform. And the device always has to go to all all old standards, all old certifications, and they have to work on their own. So you just train you uh, you just train up front and then as long as you have the same approval cycles i think it nothing will change you will just be way faster in going in in, in reaching new ways uh, new accuracies better predictions and this is i think uh, so, so we didn't ha really had that problem because we were we don't we we just have one customer per country and we work pretty close with them and i think they have a pretty good understanding and you also see with SNCF, i mean 300 people as as i understood are working on that topic inside SNCF. so they have a really clear picture and a, a really clear understanding to just get a problem when people just move, uh, watch some some movies and they see a terminator uh, walking around and uh, but this is not reality. This is also science fiction. Do you want to react on that? No? Well, I, I think security for SunSurf is really something that is totally, I mean, the, the, yes. the, bas the basic. Yeah, security for SunSurf, um, if you allow me, it will be an ODNA for at least, for instance, two reasons. Uh, first, because SNCF is um, uh, it's an operator of essential services. So we have specific regulation to, uh, to follow. Then second, SNCF, also it's voyagesncf.com, which is the main, uh, the, first, number, the number one, the leading e-commerce website in France. So we do have a culture about uh, what, what we have to do with security. So for IoT, we, op we applied the, um, the same thing. So we had uh, cybersecurity layer to uh, from the sensor through the network to the platform but if you allow me I would also like to add that AI actually can increase the security let's take a concrete example um, we have we are dealing with the security department of SNCF in order to understand to identify some specific events and to understand them and to do that we you had to compute quite a few uh, amount of data and specifically our data scientists had to read thousands and thousands of uh, uh, reports to identify well the causes of those events but to do that you can spend months to read them or you can use uh, actually a semantic analysis that they talk NLP for natural language processing and with that it's AI actually and uh, it helped us to save a lot of time and then to deliver uh, m the, our project in shorter time. So I think really AI can be a good thing also for the security purpose. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy, what are the things that we cannot expect from AI? I heard that you spoke about movies and, and science <laughs> fiction, so we cannot expect AI to solve everything. We cannot expect AI to be magic. We cannot expect AI to be instantaneous in terms of development and completely free. We need to be uh, solid on what we do. And there are multiple debates about how we can ensure that large company will develop AI tomorrow. Maybe some debates are quite good and for instance we can ask the question about are we going to co-create and are we going to uh, develop together IP or are we going to just buy some solution? But some debates I think are really too soon to understand about it. For instance, we need to be extremely uh, lucid on the fact that a few things are going to be solved by AI today and we need to focus on that today and we cannot trying to solve everything like we, we could expect. Uh, the, the way I feel is there is a major uh, thing that will ha arrive in the next few years and we need to, to really uh, think about in the way about ethics and, and, and economics. I, I think that the, the, the biggest threat 
about uh, AI is not really about doing it or not doing it. Even we have, we, we have security problems or ethics or, or privacy uh, suggestion. I think that the main problem today is the fact that we are not very good at doing AI, generally speaking, in large companies and particularly in France. And if we don't want to be Why? in a situation that tomorrow will be dependent of software companies com coming from the US that are completely black box and that ask us to pay so that we can give them their de our data so that they can bring us inside and they will use the data to be better and to provide other insight to other company, we might be in a situation that tomorrow France will be dependent on other companies in the way the sovereignty of algorithm can be done. And I think it's extremely dangerous. GDPR, the new um, yes. European yeah. resolution, can help to go and to go faster on that. But we need, really need to have uh, a strong way of uh, taking in account AI and the way we can develop it in, in the large companies. So I, I, I know that SNCF is very good at that. And I thank again everything that has been done at the Big Data Fab, which is really a center of excellence in everything connected to data. But there are so many other things to do. And, and one of the first is like to uh, um, help other companies understand how important is it for, for the future of their economy. Sebastian, you wanted to react to what, what something? On two things about uh, what you should not expect from AI. Um, I think uh, the first thing that came into to, 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 uh, people's mind is uh, what about Terminator? And we are really far away from that for at least two things, because you need consensusness and for the time being, AI, I think it's, uh, you have so much years before reaching that goal. And second, because it's about robotics, and for the time being, robots are existing, but uh, for that purpose, that are very expensive to produce, and the production cost is decreasing very slowly on robotics. So uh, let's not fear about any uh, Terminator uh, side. Uh, regarding the sovereignty, I fully agree. I think, uh, once again, the uh, key success factor will be the speed to implement. We have technology that evolve uh, very quickly, uh, but what is at stake also is the way we integrate them. If we are good at in integrating them, at industrializing them, then you, take, you can take some uh, margin uh, regarding the uh, international competition. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks. Extrêmement intéressant pour Talon de participer à ce genre d'intervention. D'abord parce qu'on on permet de faire partager l'expérience notamment de la SNCF qui est un de nos gros clients, un de nos gros partenaires. C'est extrêmement intéressant de voir comment est-ce qu'ils utilisent l'intelligence artificielle pour améliorer et pour être encore plus efficaces dans leurs problématiques de qualité de service, de maintenance prédictive, d'efficacité, de, de qualité des infrastructures. Donc euh, une, une opportunité euh, extrêmement intéressante pour nous de les entendre euh, partager leur expérience, euh, leurs attentes, euh, leur, euh, les, les problèmes éventuellement aussi qu'ils ont à, à gérer. Et, et on voit ce qui est extrêmement intéressant dans cette intervention, c'est que derrière le côté technologique de l'intelligence artificielle et de l'IoT, il y a aussi beaucoup de change management et d'humain. Et donc même quand on intègre des technologies comme ça, Finalement, il y a quand même toujours une très grosse part d'humain qui intervient et le témoignage de la SNCF en ça a été particulièrement intéressant.